The century has knocked out power to all three and a half million people who live on the island. Hurricane Maria made landfall this morning as a Category 4 storm. High winds and flooding taking down power lines over the entire island. Just two weeks after Puerto Rico escaped with what was only a glancing blow from Hurricane Irma. As of right now, tropical storm force winds are still raging over the island, and the governor has imposed a curfew trying to deter looters. Despite the strength of this storm, no deaths have been reported. But emergency services are being forced to wait, wait for the high winds and flooding to subside before they can get back out on the streets to assess what is expected to be significant damage. Fox News correspondent Steve Harrigan is in San Juan with our report. Lou, remarkable structural damage here everywhere you look. We've seen chunks of the building, chunks of the roof, entire balconies, satellite dishes, everything ripped off these major hotels. The winds were gusting through here, ripping through at more than 145 miles per hour for about two hours straight. The wind damage has caused the brunt of the destruction so far, but there could be more trouble ahead. Several rivers have warnings issued for flash floods, and there could be a storm surge still ahead of several feet. So Puerto Rico is certainly not out of the woods yet. An interesting situation, too, with the electrical power grid. It was already weak from being hit by Irma two weeks ago. More than a million people were out of power after that storm. That was just a glancing blow. This, however, has been a direct hit, a real worst-case scenario for the island of Puerto Rico, something that has not happened here in more than 80 years. Right now, this American territory, the entire island of almost 3.5 million people, is practically without power, completely dark. Now, there have been no reported incidents of looting, but certainly a very combustible situation, an island in the dark, people in desperate situations, and really uh, a very limited security presence on the streets. But no, no reports of looting as of yet, but certainly something to watch. They have put in a curfew established from 6 p.m. tonight to 6 a.m. That will run through Saturday. Lou, back to you. Steve, thank you very much. Steve Harrigan reporting from San Juan. And now this is the latest video of the central region of Mexico hit by a 7.1 magnitude earthquake yesterday. Rescuers descending on Mexico City and uh, much of the Puebla uh, province uh, in Mexico. At least 225 people were killed in the earthquake. Dozens of buildings collapsed, including homes, schools, office buildings. And the efforts to clear away the debris of those collapsed buildings continuing at this hour. This earthquake came two weeks after a magnitude 8.1 earthquake hit Mexico City. Yesterday, also the 32nd anniversary of an earthquake that killed as many as 10,000 people back in 1985. Mexico's president has declared three days of national mourning. Well, President Trump offering assistance to Mexico during a call with a Mexican president today. The president today, with a, an enormously busy schedule, he also announced he's made a decision on what to do about the Iranian nuclear deal, but the public will have to wait to hear what his decision is. Have you decided to stay or to leave? Well, I have decided. Okay. Can you tell us what you're I'll let you know. I'll let you know. Okay. His comments coming a day after the president, in a highly praised speech to the General Assembly, called that agreement an embarrassment to the United States and promised we all will hear much more from the White House on the matter. Interestingly, many key world leaders were not in New York City to hear the president's speech. China's Xi Jinping, Russia's Vladimir Putin, and German Chancellor Angela Merkel, all remaining at home. Well, stunning new developments tonight in the left-wing crusade to intimidate and discredit the president and his associates. The witch hunt that began in the Obama administration's intelligence operation and continues to this day in the form of special counsel Robert Mueller's runaway Russia probe. Today, we learn Mueller's dragnet has now extended to the man who appointed him and supposedly oversees his investigation as special counsel. That man is Deputy Attorney General Ron Rosenstein. He was interviewed in the summer by Mueller's team. Rosenstein authored the memorandum justifying the firing of FBI Director Comey and calling for that firing. It is a document that he says he stands by to this very day. We also learned that Mueller's 
well, assembly of uh, what appear to be Democratic attorneys uh, rife with ties to the Obama and Clinton uh, uh, regimes are going back more than a decade now trying, trying to find some evidence of wrongdoing on the part of former Trump campaign manager Paul Manafort, scrutinizing his business deals all the way back to 2006. Now, this comes just two days after we learned that the FBI indeed had been wiretapping Manafort before and after the election, a claim first made by President Trump and some Republican lawmakers, a claim that was vehemently denied by the Obama intelligence team until now. Wiretap covers a lot of different things. I think you're going to find some very interesting items coming to the forefront over the next two weeks. Let me be clear. I've been saying this for several weeks. We know there was not a physical wiretap of Trump Tower. However, it's still possible that other surveillance activities were used against President Trump and his associates. There was no such wiretap activity mounted against uh, the president, uh, the president elect at the time or as a candidate or against his campaign. And as if all of that was not enough, we also discovered today that President Obama's ambassador to the United Nations Samantha Power went on an unmasking spree in the final year of the administration. Fox News reports that Power asked for confidential identities to be revealed in more than 260 incidences. The final request coming just days before President Trump's inauguration. Joining me now to talk about the Obama administration's shocking Shocking surveillance, the lies of the leaders of two of its intelligence agencies, and to give us some sense of what he thinks is going on in this environment and why there is so much attention being paid to what has been a futile uh, year and a half of searching by uh, investigators into collusion between the Trump campaign and Russia and an absolute dismissal of all that was done under President Obama. We are joined now by retired Lieutenant Colonel Tony Schaefer. He's a senior fellow with the London Center for Policy Research. Let's start, Tony, if we may, sure. uh, with uh, these revelations. We now know uh, that we, we, we knew John Brennan was lying. We've had in other instances of Clapper lying. Absolutely. But these men are lying uh, as, a, as a matter of course. And they have led two of the most important intelligence agencies in this country. Right. I, why is there not a full-on investigation? And I'm talking about grand juries. I'm talking about going after these people to find out who the hell they think they are and whether or not this is the most corrupt government in American history. Well, let's cut to the chase. This is all about vengeance. Uh, most of these folks, Lou, are affiliated, associated in some form with Hillary Clinton. This is punishment. This is the deep state trying to organize itself. Uh, first off, they didn't think they would be caught. All these little shenanigans that we now have learned about would have never been disclosed under a, Hil a President Hillary Clinton. So fortunately for us, we have a President Trump who first off has identified the fact he was indeed uh, wiretapped, and right. we're, I'm using it in the greatest possible terms. Surveilled. Th surveilled, right. and, uh, and now we're learning about the scope of it. So to your point about what to do, look, I've been in con consultation with a number of folks behind the scenes on this, and there are some key issues that I don't think uh, Mr. Comey, uh, Mr. Mueller are aware of regarding some of the mistakes made of the past, which are really on their watch. And I think there are some issues that need to be looked at by a new investigative team to examine uh, their own wrongdoing. And Lou, some of this goes back uh, as far as the 9-11 attacks. So we've got to be uh, very much aware that these folks have a deep history going back to that mm -hmm. time frame, the late 90s. They've worked together through that entire time frame. No one interfered with them. And now what you see is essentially bitterness uh, in the form of organized bureaucratic you know, investigations trying to make Mr. Trump's uh, uh, presidency a, a failure. And I think that this should be pushed back on them. Yeah, I, 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 the subversion of the Trump administration is, yes. is obvious. It's transparent in point of fact to the point that it, I think, as you say, these folks never dreamed it would be the, that would be the case. Right. But the greater issue to me now is how corrupt are our intelligence agencies? Wow. Well, and, and this is deeply disturbing. Uh, it rises beyond the, the permanent government, the deep state, whatever you want to call it, uh, and, and goes to 
a government that, is, uh, as President Trump himself said, is a candidate, uh, it's rigged. And right. this is now rigged against a president, a duly elected government uh, that is being aided and abetted by the donor class, the establishment of both parties, the leadership particularly uh, of the Republican Party, particularly on Capitol right. Hill. This is an organized attack on Precisely. a sitting president. And let me link something that maybe your audience hasn't noted, and I think you and I spoke about this. Look, one of the reasons we have so many foreign policy failures is because President Obama and, and Ben Rhodes, Susan Rice, uh, they all turned the, the, the power of our foreign intelligence collection system on us, on the American people, on political rivals. So that's what you're seeing here. And yes, to your point, the corruption goes deep. Uh, we're talking about Jim Clapper, who I continue to believe is an idiot because he will take and do whatever he is told, no matter how legal mm -hmm. it is. John Brennan is, is cut from work, the same cloth. Did you work for Jim Clapper? I, I worked for Jim Clapper. He promoted me to GS-12, uh, uh, as a matter of fact. And uh, when he was director of DIA, I was actually overseeing Army's uh, clandestine human intelligence program. I had to brief him on several programs. And, and Lou, I'm telling you, uh, uh, I, you know, I was in with a guy named General Pat, uh, Lieutenant General Pat Hughes, who was a J-2, and I briefed the man. That unless someone is holding his hand, feeding him information, he is completely an empty suit, which tells me that's why he has been so successful in the role he played in the Obama administration. Mm -hmm. He was fed things, he would do what he was told, and he could care less, as we've seen, Lou. He lied to the American people in Congress so on two, at least Brennan. two separate so occasions. Did, so did John So Brennan. did Susan Rice. I mean, you so go did, through all of them. This is, this is not just the deep state. This was an organized yes, administration sir. intent on working against the national interest of the United States. Right. There is no other rational no, no explanation other for no what excuse. we have witnessed. Yes, sir. And we've got to get organized to go after it. And I think that's the next step for the president. I would, I would hope urgently so. Yes, sir. Lieutenant Colonel Tony Schaefer, good to Thanks, have sir. you with us, Tony. Thanks, Lou. We're coming right back. A lot more, a lot more ahead. And no, not all of it's pleasant, but we hope you will stay with us nonetheless. We'll be right back. Special counsel Robert Mueller, unchecked, out of control, and now he's even interviewing his own boss. They have phony witch hunts going against me. They have everything going. And you know what? All we do is win, win, win. Next, we'll take up the never-ending witch hunt against President Trump with Judicial Watch's Tom Fitton. Stay with us. We're coming right back. On the next Kennedy, President Trump tells the U.N. America is carrying too much of the world's financial weight. I will ask Ambassador John Bolton how other leaders will respond. Next Kennedy. The special counsel, has he or has he not exceeded his authority? And just how corrupt are the leaderships of num a num number of our intelligence agency? We're joined now by Tom Fitt. He's the president of Judicial Watch, and he is leading... Uh, much of the charge uh, to find out what happened in the Obama administration and what some of these government agencies have been doing against the interest of the American people. Tom, good to have you here. Hey, Lou, good to be with you again. Let, let's start with these revelations today, uh, the reporting uh, that Bob Mueller, the special counsel, interviewed Rod Rosenstein, the deputy attorney general, who is his boss. He has oversight uh, over... Mueller and the special counsel. And yet, after an interview, uh, Rosenstein doesn't uh, recuse himself. Uh, the Mueller just moves ahead. What is going on here? Well, Mueller is investigating himself, in my view, uh, because the firing of Comey led to his appointment. Uh, Comey's leaking of information led to his appointment. And uh, Sessions recused himself almost immediately from anything of substance as it relates to Clinton and this whole Russia scandal. And so we're faced a, with a constitutional mess over at the Justice Department where Rosenstein is being interviewed by the guy he's supposed to be supervising in theory. Uh, but, you know, I think we should but take a step back. But who he also appointed. He, uh, right. And, um, and he's, the only reason he appointed him because Sessions recused himself. So by Rosenstein's own uh, lights, he shouldn't be there either supervising Mueller. But let me just say this. I think the special counsel regulations and, and Mueller's appointment mm -hmm. are constitutionally suspect. Because Mueller isn't really a U.S. attorney. He's not a U.S. attorney. He hasn't been subject to Senate confirmation. He's not supervised in a day-to-day -day basis by Rosenstein or anyone else, else at DOJ. At best, he can be fired after the fact. 
but he doesn't have to go to them for permission to issue a subpoena, raid uh, Mr. Manafort's homes with gun, uh, home with guns and things like that. Guns drawn. Uh, right. Guns drawn. And um, Locks that, to me, picked, is constitutionally by the way, by suspect. Some of the agents. Yeah, who does he work for? He doesn't work for the American people. He works. He's an appointed bureaucrat who is okay. exercising powers. I don't think he should be able to. Well, you may not think that. I may not think that. Uh, millions of Americans can't think that because it just isn't American the way this thing is proceeding. We have seen previous special counsels. This one has gone so far beyond his charter that it's stunning. And the leadership of the Senate, Republican leadership of the Senate, Republican leadership of the House are not raising their hand even a moment to say, we really need to have some discussion here about the way you're comporting yourself and the way you're moving ahead. This has been under investigation, as you well know, this so-called collusion for more than a year by the FBI and now for five months by the so-called special counsel. It is, at, at this point, the American people have got to be wondering, after watching Clapper lie again, watching Brennan's lies unfold before us. What in the world is this government, so-called, uh, that was left behind by Barack Obama? How rancid is it? How corrupt is it? Well, you know, when you have the leader of the opposition, uh, Manafort, <coughs> close to President Trump in the least, whether in or outside the campaign, being surveilled by the Obama administration, uh, you really have improper intervention in the elections. You know, look, it goes back to 2012. Obama used the IRS. Robert Mueller's FBI collaborated with the IRS to figure out ways to prosecute the very groups the IRS was targeting to suppress the Tea Party movement and, and, and a successful effort, in my view, to steal the election in 2012. 2016 comes, rolls around. You've got the FBI uh, and DOJ protecting Hillary Clinton mm -hmm. and targeting Donald Trump in an unsuccessful effort to intervene in the election. And Mueller himself is a witness in this issue. So what he are we doing, he Tom? interviewed what are we he interviewed do? for the job. He interviewed for the job. I, I understand. I why? understand. We've if been chronicling I, sessions this, Tom. should sessions I should understand is what can we do about it? Sessions the American should understand. people are not going to just sit here and be rolled over again uh, by a corrupt federal government. We need to make sure that the Amer the officials who have the public trust and responsibility step up to the plate. Who, who would that be, Tom? I Sessions mean, you're should going to recuse turn himself. To, are you going to turn to the Speaker of the House, the Senate Majority Leader? Are you going to turn to one of the agencies, the intelligence agencies, the law enforcement agency that is the FBI, whose leaders are so corrupt that it is, it is so disgusting, most Americans can't even uh, stomach the idea of it? I think uh, if Sessions doesn't step up and unrecuse unrec un himself, and take control over this rogue special counsel investigation, the president should exercise his authority under the Constitution to police the Justice Department and remove Mr. Mueller. I, at this point, you know he would be eaten alive uh, by his own party. This is, this, he, that really isn't a possibility for him in the near term. Well, I don't know what else to do. I mean, he's the responsible official. Uh, Sessions has recused himself. Maybe he'll maybe he'll unrecuse himself and do the right thing. But Mueller now, it's reported today, is asking the White House about everything under the sun in terms of Mr. Uh, uh, President Trump's firings of General Flynn and Mr. Comey. So the White House has been torn asunder by this yeah. investigation watching, that is compromised from the beginning. We have to go, Tom. But what we're watching, in my judgment, is the establishment, which owns both political parties' leadership, we're watching the establishment use Mueller for what he is used best, and that is as a, as a tool uh, against the one person, the one person who can change the direction of what has been an increasing uh, corruption in federal government, and that is the President of the United States. That's right. And it's, it's, I think it's that straightforward. Tom, as always, great to have you here. Uh, keep up your continued great work. Thanks so much. You're welcome, Lou. Thank you. Be sure to vote in our poll tonight. The question is, do you believe Special Counsel Mueller has now egregiously exceeded the original mandate for his investigation? Cast your vote on Twitter at Lou Dobbs. We'd love to hear from you. Follow me on Twitter at Lou Dobbs. Like me on Facebook and Instagram at Lou Dobbs tonight. On Wall Street, stocks closing mix, but posting records. The Dow up 42 points at a new record high. The S&P up two, also at a record high. The Nasdaq down five points. 
Volume on the big board, three and a half billion shares. The Fed announcing it will begin unwinding its four and a half trillion dollar balance sheet in October. The Fed also eyeing one more rate hike, we're told, by the chair this year. Uh, we hope they'll follow the markets instead of the way they proceeded uh, over the past two years. Apple shares down and down big after the company reported cellular connectivity problems with its latest iWatch. And Amazon reportedly developing Alexa-enabled smart glasses. There's a combination, apparently forgetting the failure of Google Glass. And a reminder to listen to my reports three times a day, coast to coast, on the Salem Radio Network. Up next here, the state of California has seemingly declared war on the Trump administration. And the national left-wing nut media, well, they just don't want to report about it. We'll take care of that here tonight. We're coming right back. Stay with us. Exceptional reporting every business day. Trust FBN for in-depth insight, breaking headlines, smart investigations, and the latest business buzz from Wall Street to Washington to the heartland. If it moves the markets, it's already on Fox Business Network. The vast national left-wing nut media is ignoring a very important story unfolding on the West Coast. It's becoming increasingly clear that the state of California, the government of California, has organized much of its state government and legal resources for one purpose, to mount a campaign of harassment and obstruction against the Trump administration. The campaign appears to be led by a cabal of left-wing politicos fronted by none other than Governor Jerry Brown. With the election of Kamala Harris to the Senate, longtime Congressman Javier Becerra resigned his seat in the House to be appointed attorney general by the governor. Becerra today did what he's been doing since the election of President Trump, filing a lawsuit against the administration, trying to block one of the president's signature campaign promises, namely the border wall. But this isn't the first such action that the Democratic AG has taken against this White House. In fact, California's new attorney general has filed more than two dozen lawsuits and legal briefs against the Trump administration. He doesn't have time to do much in state government. He has political targets. DACA, the travel ban, redistricting, regulations, air quality, fuel standards, to name just a few. But Sarah's efforts to frustrate the Trump agenda, supported by the state's leftists and the Democratic legislature that has passed more than 10 so-called resistance bills this session, have, to this point, been unsuccessful. The bills offering protection for dreamers calling for the censure of President Trump, refusing to provide federal election officials voter data, and most notably, making California a sanctuary state, a move with Attorney General Sessions, which he calls unconscionable. Well, unconscionable or not, Jerry Brown's going to sign that state law. All the while, California also looking to increase its influence in the 2020 election. Lawmakers there passing the bill to move the presidential primary in California from June all the way up to March. California's efforts to this point demonstrate that California's state officials, elected and otherwise, are so radicalized that they are intent on pushing their agenda through, and no one should doubt that efforts to push California towards secession will only strengthen, be strengthened by the left, and they may well have already taken all but full control of the state government. Our quotation of the evening, this one from Charles de Gaulle, who said, politics too serious a matter to be left to the politicians and also to be left to the media. We're coming right back. Stay with us. GOP leaders' last-ditch efforts to dismantle Obamacare picking up momentum. Will it be enough? Obamacare is a disaster. It's failing badly. I believe that uh, Graham Cassidy really will, will do it the right way. Can the GOP leadership on Capitol Hill really deliver a legislative victory this time? We take that up with the Dean, Ed Rollins. And this group of brave and selfless divers going on a rescue mission. We'll show you the heartwarming video and much more next. We're coming right back with that and more. Joining me now, Ed Rollins. He served in three presidential administrations, chief political advisor of the House, Republican leadership, the dean himself. Let's start, Ed, with uh, uh, this talk of a new health care uh, initiative that will result in glory days for the Republican Party. 
Is it going to work? Uh, you can wave the flag and say it's a glory. It's not, it's not repealing uh, Obamacare. It's basically uh, taking the present program with some minor modifications and sending it back to the state. That itself is better, but it's not a repeal. It's not basically saving taxpayers money long term. Uh, and so well, they're going to keep they're going to keep uh, much of the cost basis of Obamacare plus absolutely. add to it the block grants of uh, Graham uh, and Cassidy. I, I why can't these why in the heck cannot Ryan and McConnell be straight? They are crooked to the bone. They can't talk straight. They can't be honest. They can't be forthright. Well, John McCain has basically said the old process has to ha go through where you basically have public hearings. Regular you know, order. You know what's in a bill. Uh, I've been around Congress for 50 years, and that's the way it's always been done, and you get pretty good legislation. We don't do that anymore. By the it's way, the in the House, they were talking about, they were promising the right. American people that. They didn't do that. Lying through their teeth, lying again. Through the, lying through the teeth. You're not going to see the tax bill till it's ready to go. Uh, you know, we get little bits and pieces here, and the whole premise of not showing you the tax bill before it's ready to go out there is because... People will go fight elements of it. Well, the bottom line, if you can't sell your program, it's, it shouldn't be part of legislation. That's well, it's a hell of a nuisance, isn't it? Democracy. It's, democracy is a hell of a nuisance, but we need to I do mean, it. And the country's never going to be satisfied until we do it. And, and the, the reality is, again, so... And the, well, I hope you're right. I hope that, I hope voters, I hope American citizens will say, this is still our country, and you idiots, get your acts together. Well, it's, it's, it's festering more and more, and I think to a certain extent... Uh, Trump should be leading that charge, and he will be, I think, before long. Uh, uh, let's take a look at some images of John Kelly. Have we got these images? Uh, we don't have the images. I'm sorry. I thought I've seen, I forgot this. I've seen the picture. Yeah, this, you did see you, it. I did see the picture. Well, I it's hope that book. everybody at home has, too. And I hope our producers remember to visualize some of what we say here from time to time. Uh, the man sitting there with his, you know, palm slapped against his uh, forehead. Uh, what, was, what was all of that? And why should any president put up with it? Well, he shouldn't, in my sense, and at least, at least what I've heard from sources inside, uh, know Kelly, who's, who's an honorable man and, a, and was a good general, he didn't vote, he voted for Hillary. Uh, so I don't think he basically is a Trump supporter or ideologically a Trump then supporter. Then what is the excuse for having the man there, ringside at the General Assembly for the, the, such an important speech, playing the part, I mean, he's playing the fool. Who does, I mean, if he were in a drama class, that could be extraordinarily well, rewarding. He, he has to, he has there to, we go. There he is. He has to, he has to realize now, if this, is a, this is about the third photo shot they've taken of him, uh, of him looking disgusted, what have you. And I think to a certain extent, he just needs to be behind the scenes. Chief of staff doesn't have to be out front in the picture, so he can be behind the scenes. Okay, but we have the good fortune of having seen how he feels. Right. So why should the president put up with this? Well, the president, president needs to basically ask in a private meeting someday with his high, top advisors, how many of you are really for me? How many of you voted for me? How many of you believe in what I believe in? Uh, when I make a speech like this, how many of you are 100% behind me? And if you're not, just basically uh, leave. Very quickly. Can the president fire politically? Can he? We, I know he can't legally. Fire Mueller, who is on some sort of crusade that I can't comprehend. Mueller has, has really moved beyond any of these... Uh, uh, He's now looking back. Manafort's not a good guy. I've known Manafort for a long time, and I, I was surprised when Trump hired him. But you shouldn't be going back 10, 15 years. The issue is... This looks like a Soviet persecution. It, it does. If, if this was going on and it was a Soviet persecution, uh, we would be, all be appalled by it. Uh, my sense is if you have something against Manafort, fine, indict him. Uh, but don't basically... The idea that the President of the United States, after he's, he's been elected, through. has yeah. been, been on, a, on a wiretap, and no one in the government basically said to him, Mr. President, you have to understand, we are president-elect, we are basically going after Manafort beyond all this, and you should know what's going on here. You know, and, and, and Ryan and McConnell better understand something, and so had the Republican establishment. The American people are, who voted for this president are not going to put up with him being messed with no, much longer no. because it's reached egregiously uh, disgusting and appalling levels. Uh, it, it's undemocratic, and, well, and it's un-American. They're chipping at him every single day. He's still doing, doing good things, and he's still strong, but at the end of the day, he should not be distracted by all of this mess. No. And by the way, uh, Robert Mueller should be. He should be the focus of an investigation. So should James Comey. So should Hillary Clinton. Well, the attorney general needs to step back into this game. Uh, and well, I don't think you... I think Jeff Sessions is lost to us. I don't know why, and it's deeply, uh, it's deeply tragic. But there it is. Still his justice department. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thanks so much. Thank you. Ed Rollins. Please roll the video now, and we'll show you some brave divers uh, who come face to face with whale sharks tangled in a massive net.
uh, and they courageously dive to free them. Four of them, huge mammals, and one diver even riding uh, one out of the net. Now that takes some guts, folks. And uh, by the way, the whales stuck around uh, to be with their uh, rescuers. Uh, that was awfully nice, and nothing untoward happened afterwards, which I am pleased to be able to report to you. Up next, millions of dollars pouring into Alabama. Republican Luther Strange and Republican Roy Moore. It's a high-stakes runoff for the Senate next week. Tony Perkins of the Family Research Council supports Roy Moore. He explains right after the break. Stay with us. President Trump praising loyal Luther Strange ahead of a uh, campaign rally for the Alabama Senator Friday. Senate Majority Leader McConnell's PAC has spent nearly, are you ready for this, $9 million boosting the establishment candidate ahead of next week's Republican Senate primary runoff and attacking his opponent, Roy Moore. Moore, by the way, still leads by eight points. Joining me now to talk about that Senate battle in Alabama uh, is, uh, well, we are pleased to uh, have with us tonight Tony Perkins. He's the head of the Family Research Council, and he's also, you're backing uh, Roy Moore. How did you make the decision? I am. Well, R Roy Moore is a fighter. He, he's been a fighter. My, uh, my third day at the helm at uh, the Family Research Council 14 years ago, I was on the steps of the uh, Alabama State Court, Supreme Court, where they were rolling out the Ten Commandments that he had defended. Look, I, I can say a lot of great things about uh, Roy Moore. I can say good things about Luther Strange. I like both men. This race really is not about Roy Moore and Luther Strange. This is about the people versus a Republican Senate that is broken, that has become the graveyard of all good things. And mm -hmm. it's, uh, it's time to change it. And Roy Moore is a fighter, and I believe he'll, he'll work to change it. Well, in this instance, Mitch McConnell wants to be the head grave digger. Uh, and, he wants to, well, and he wants to kick Roy Moore into that uh, political grave. Uh, and it's really strange because Mitch McConnell hasn't done a dang gum thing for President Trump. Why would a populist president put himself in the position opposing the will of the Republican Party, the people of Alabama? Well, I, I'm not sure. I can't answer that for certain, but I would think it's probably that Luther Strange responded in some way to the White House in a request to do something. Maybe mm -hmm. it was the first go-round on the repeal of Obamacare that he was supportive. I'm not sure, but I do know this, that Donald Trump is a man of his word, and if someone, he commits to something, he's going to do it. But let's look at what's happened in that Yeah, let Republican me be clear Senate. about something, too, Tony. You haven't said it. Uh, Tony Perkins uh, supports the president. He, uh, as he just said, he likes Luther Strange uh, as well as Roy Moore. So you've made the choice based on values and what you perceive to be the best interest of uh, uh, of the folks of uh, Alabama as they've, as they've indicated through their votes. Where do we go here? It, no, it, no dancing on this. I mean, there's just, right now you've got a contest between the establishment, a man who's sold out to the establishment, lock, stock, and barrel. That's Mitch McConnell. Uh, and you're in a contest with the President of the United States. And where does it go? Well, you have Roy Moore, who is, has shown he is willing to shake things up and stand for the, the Constitution, things right. that he cares about. He's a fighter. And, and you look at what's happened in the Senate. The House repeals Obamacare, sends it to the Senate, it dies. They repeal Dodd-Frank, they send it over to the Senate, it dies. Man, they repeal Tony, you don't have to convince me or any member of our, our audience here about who Mitch McConnell is and what a, what a mess he is. At, and that's why this race is so important, because I believe Roy Moore will not be a part of the problem. Yeah. I believe he'll be is a he part of win bringing it? about a solution. I think, I think he has a very good chance. Never underestimate him. He, he was, uh, he's been attacked before, and he's come back winning every time. I believe he's got a very, very good shot at winning this race, even though the president on this particular case is on the wrong side, in my view. Tony Perkins, great to have you with us. Good to see you. Thanks, Lou. Tony Perkins, head of the Family Research Council. Up next, President Trump striking back at crooked Hillary's criticisms of his landmark speech at the United Nations. We'll take it up with Charlie Hurt, Molly Hemingway. They join us here next. Stay with us. She looks really good there, don't you think? We'll be right back. In our online poll last night, we asked, do you believe that Schumer, Pelosi, and other Dems' criticism of President Trump's strong speech at the United Nations suggests they're worried about hurting the feelings of Kim Jong-un and the Ayatollahs? 90% of you say yes. 
Well, joining me now, Molly Hemingway, senior editor for The Federalist. Good to have you with us, Molly. Washington Times opinion editor Charlie Hurt, both Fox News contributors, and Charlie, of course, good to have you with us as well. Good to be with you, Lou. Uh, but I am going to start with Molly, even even though that you is should. the the equitable <laughs> She's uh, thing <smarter>. to do. <laughs> <laughs> than all of us, right? Yes. Uh, Molly, good to have you with us, as I said. I, I just have to ask, let's let's get to it right now. Hillary Clinton is, <laughs> n I, I mean, this woman, I is she okay? <laughs> she certainly seems to be having a lot of trouble accepting reality, but she's not alone there. There's a good portion of the country that is struggling with this. But, no, I wouldn't say she's shown the healthiest level of self uh, self-introspection or anything like that, and she unfortunately has a bunch of people encouraging her to do anything other than look inward at why she lost. And, and, and Charlie, your quick judgment on this, I, I mean, I just cannot imagine what she, why she's doing what she's doing. Yeah, I don't know if she's uh, uh, going completely crazy, uh, if she's uh, m more crazy than she was when she ran, but whatever it is uh, that's wrong with her, I hope she keeps doing it because it's really terrific. Uh, for uh, conservatives and the Republican Party, and I think for Donald Trump. I think that every time she opens her mouth and gets into some sort of uh, squonk with uh, the president, uh, he comes away winning, and, of course, Democrats would do anything to get her to stop talking. California versus the president of the United States, Molly. <laughs> I, I, can you believe that the state government is spending the money, the time, and the energy trying to frustrate a sitting president and his agenda? As a former resident of California, this is the least surprising news that you could possibly have. <laughs> and they've been doing this actually since, you remember, they actually issued a joint statement the day after he was elected, right. saying that they would be doing resistance. You know, it's nice to see people on the left embrace federalism. Unfortunately for California, <laughs> a lot of the, I mean, immigration is one of those areas that's explicitly laid out in the Constitution as a power yeah. for the federal government. So they might have a little more trouble resisting in that regard than they would like. And resisting, I, I mean, we're watching a state simply implode. Out there today, Attorney General Jeff Sessions trying to explain to the governor and persuade him <laughs> not to sign a sanctuary state bill. Yeah. What do you think well, are the odds? Well, well but I, I think a lot like uh, the situation with Hillary Clinton, I, you know, this resist movement I think is great for Donald Trump. I think that, that uh, there are a lot of people around the country sitting, sitting at home, they're watching this stuff, whether it's the protests at Berkeley uh, or, or any of this other nonsense that they're seeing, uh, and they're just shaking their head thinking, my yeah. goodness, I can't wait till the next election so I can vote for this guy again. Yeah. Because there's no doubt where the, the vast majority of American people come down in this debate, especially this debate over sanctuary cities. It's an 80-20 issue. Do you think, and I'm going to be very kind, I'm not going to call anybody a name, but do you believe <laughs> Good that luck. all of these folks in California and indeed around the country in this resistance movement, do you think a, one of them understands that their candidate, Hillary Clinton's husband, never got 50 percent of the vote in two elections and in fact in his first election had a lower percentage of the popular vote than president trump won in 2016 molly you know i mean this is just it's ignorance on parade <laughs> across the entire country on the part of the of the democrats the left-wing resistance active these are i said i, I wasn't going to use a name <laughs> Sorry. I can understand pe some people on the left having difficulty accepting what happened Why? in November because Why? they because they were lied they live to. In America, by, we got laws. We got what order. I'm saying is the media made it seem like there was no way in the world that Donald Trump could win the presidency. So I can understand if it took them a few days or a few weeks to come to terms with reality. We're in late September now. It is beyond the time when people need to just grow up accept reality, learn to deal with the fact that someone that they wanted didn't okay. win an election and someone who, who they didn't want did. I want to ask you very quickly, if I may, uh, Charlie. John Kelly, face palming of the United Nations, a historic, I think the strongest speech I've ever, ever heard a president give uh, at the General Assembly, and he is, he's, he's pulling this uh, nonsense with his body language. What he, do you make he of does, it? I, I don't know if it was in response to the speech or not, but one thing is for sure, he has to know at this point that the cameras are on him, they're watching him at all of these events, and he needs to be a little bit more careful with his body language, because it does not help his, his boss uh, to have all these stories. Or maybe it doesn't really matter with the people uh, that matter most, which are the voters, but, uh, but it is, it, it's, it's unseemly. Unseemly, and, uh, and how about, we've got just, I, I can't get to it. <laughs> We'll, we'll take up 
Well, we'll take up Obamacare the next time we meet, Molly, <laughs> Charlie. Thank okay. you both for being Thanks, with us. Lou. And thank you for joining us tonight. Kellyanne Conway joins us tomorrow. Good night.